Our first reading this morning is from Revelations chapter 6. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth, to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in its hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named a death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of their word because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the earth, big sky, in the sky, fell to earth as fig drops from a fig tree were shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and uh, the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? From Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Moving down to verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
Then one of the elders asked me, These in the white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Well, we've seen John's vision begin in the first five chapters of Revelation. And it was there that he visited the throne room of God in heaven. He fell down with the angels and the elders in worship and singing in that great choir with countless creatures in heaven, shouting glory and worthy is the Lamb. But now in the beginning of chapter 6, the scene changes dramatically. Our attention turns from earth, sorry, from heaven to earth. And the praise and worship of God has changed to his wrath and judgment upon rebellious humanity. Many people, it's probably natural, I imagine, to prefer to ignore the idea of a judging God or even completely deny the idea that God would judge anybody. After all, isn't God a God of love? How can judgment and love coexist? And we all fear judgment. It's no wonder we find the book of Revelation, the ideas about the end times, controversial and disturbing. In chapters 4 and 5, you saw the Lord Almighty holding this scroll with seven seals on it. And we discovered that there was only one person in heaven and earth, Jesus, who is the lion, who is also the lamb. And he was the only one found worthy to take the scroll and open the seals and begin this process, a difficult process, of bringing about justice to the earth, of delivering it from evil and then establishing his glorious reign. That is what Revelation is about. And so as we go on, we're going to see these three symbols representing a series of future judgments in the book of Revelation. We begin today with these seven seals. Then there's going to be seven trumpets. Then there's going to be seven bowls. And this series of judgments we'll be going through is going to take the next ten chapters of Revelation. Each series describes the judgments and they overlap and they also seem to intensify as well, but they culminate in the return of Christ. Three things are important to remember, to keep in mind as we look at all these judgments. The first one is the fact that God reveals and warns of these things, of the seriousness, the severity of them. And to do that so far in advance, it clearly demonstrates his great grace because he's giving us the warning sign with plenty of time to turn to Christ, to receive that salvation that he offers before these dreadful days begin. So remember his grace as we look at these judgments. How do we respond is uh, 
the offer, really. He's putting the warning sign there. Because we see in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming that he promised? But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There's grace in that, isn't there? See, God's purpose in delaying his justice and judgment is to give people time to repent, to turn from their sin and their self, to turn to Jesus as their saviour and as the king over all of their lives. Second thing to, uh, to notice is that God's judgments are completely under his control. Even when they're carried out by natural events or even by wicked people, as we go through, notice this, that the initial action of each of these judgments takes place in heaven. Only then, after Jesus unveil, un, un, unreals, unveils that seal, as it were, do the actions on earth then take place. He is in control. This shows that God's judgments are tempered by his grace and they align with his dual purposes of establishing justice and bringing about his kingdom of righteousness. And the third thing to keep in mind is that in the midst of these terrifying events, and they are terrifying, God sees, God knows, and he's calling his people to himself. God saved Noah and his family from the flood. God saved the Jews during the exodus out of Egypt. He saved his people when they were exiled to Babylon. He saves his people. He does not save them from all suffering. But he does save them to be comforted, to be rewarded and to be with him in all eternity. So we might shy away from this idea of an angry, wrathful, judging God, choosing instead, as using the language of the day, that he's tolerant, gracious, he's loving and all these things. But the God of the Bible is all of those things. He's angry, he's wrathful, he's judging, he's loving, he's merciful, he's forgiving. It seems a bit complex and contradictory. For those of us that are parents, though, just think about how that works as you're raising children. <laughs> you're loving the child, but you get angry. You discipline, you judge, you make assessment. It's actually not that foreign to us as we think, they're not actually contradictory. We can harmonise them within ourselves, and we see them occurring throughout the Bible. We see these qualities of wrath and justice, love and mercy brought together, in fact, beautifully harmonised in the cross. The Father there is pouring out his wrath on the Son. The Son has his arms open wide in love and forgiveness as he bears our sin upon himself. Humans tend to have a rather interesting relationship with justice and judgment, don't we? <laughs> we want justice, don't we? We want justice as we see the horrors of what's been happening this week unfold on our TV screens. When we hear of a serious crime and some pretty you know, lame sentence that's passed down. We get outraged. 
you're hearing the shock jocks and it's not right and da-da-da. We want justice for everyone else. (laughs) But, you know, if we're speeding or if we're doing something wrong and get found out, uh, it's because... Well, it's just because, isn't it? Because we have an excuse. It's not our fault. There's always some circumstance of why we don't offer that grace to other people, but we always want it for ourselves. Thankfully, God's justice and judgment are not arbitrary and self-serving like we can be. God's justice is based on his character, on who he is, his holiness, his love, his purity, his righteousness, his perfection, his truth. All these things make his justice and judgment true there. Some see these seals at the beginning of chapter 6 as things that characterise the time between Jesus' first and second coming. And so they've been happening now for 2,000 years. Others see them as future events. And we've come to know them, if you have that sort of school of thought, as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You may have heard that expression. These images of the the four horsemen are heavy with symbolism and commentators have long debated the specific meaning of each one. In fact, I've got to say, the diversity of opinion as you read through the various commentaries is huge. That makes my job pretty difficult. (laughs) I mean, normally I've got a fair idea where the passage is going. I've got to say, I'm more dependent on commentators going through Revelation than at any other time. And I've got to tell you, I've read, I don't know, seven or more. And they're all different. (laughs) So I'm trying to figure it out and synthesise that or look for the majority opinion or try and... Get that. If I was sharing all the different opinions with you today, we'd be here for a week. So I've got to um, work through it somehow. But what the four horsemen of the apocalypse do is shatter the illusion that people can find security on this earth, in the borders of their nation, in their economic success, uh, with the flourishing economy, or just on their own. The detail is a bit difficult, but the big picture is very clear. Judgment is coming and God is in control. So if you have your Bibles there, it would be good to uh, encourage you to, whatever form, electronic or paper, to have Bibles with you. Um, from verse 1, I watched as the Lamb opened the... First of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held the bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. This first rider seems to operate with the threat of war, perhaps to bring peace. He has a bow, but no arrows are mentioned. The crown there referred to is not a royal crown as such. It more refers to this wreath, a short-term thing given to a victorious athlete. One commentator describes this as a bloodless conquest, that the tribulation, which is a time, we're going to hear that word a lot, the tribulation is this time of great trial, before the Lord returns, um, that this is going to begin with a deceptive peace, possibly led by the Antichrist, with threats for those that don't comply, some sort of enforced peace. 
The second seal then in verse 4 unleashes the second horse. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. He seems to be running around today, doesn't he? To him was given a large sword. Shortly after the rider of the white horse promised this peace and prosperity, the rider on the red horse breaks that promise. The colour red symbolises fire and the blood of war. It's interesting here that the Greek word used for sword is not the romphia, which was the sword of order and justice that you may remember back in chapter 1 was coming out of Jesus' mouth, that sword in chapter 1. This is a different sword, different word. This is the makara, which is the sword of war and aggression, the dagger of assassination. Verses 5 and 6, John sees a black horse. This is a symbol of famine and poverty that just about always results from warfare. And there's these measuring scales that the rider is carrying. And there's this voice that's shouting out prices that indicate that this period of time will be characterised by inflation, by scarcity, famine, starvation. Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages. They tell me this is something like 10 to 15 times what would normally be expected to pay. It might be a bit like us spending something like 40, 50, up to $70 for a loaf of bread. It doesn't leave much after that for other things, does it? If that's for the prices we were paying. And so we have this reference of oil of wine. Now that may mean that the necessities of life for the poor are going to be in short supply, but these sort of luxury goods are going to be available for the rich. Then the lamb opened the fourth seal, verses 7 and 8. And a pale horse appears. The Greek word for pale here, describing the horse's colour, is chloros, from where we get the word chlorine. It's yellowish, green, sickly colour of illness and death. Its rider is named Death. And Hades was following close behind him. They were given the power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. In this terrifying scene that John is, 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 is seeing before his eyes here, he sees like the grim reaper caval- moving over the earth and the grave digger behind him moving over that face of the earth and death steals the body while Hades consumes the soul. There will be an incredible number of deaths in their wake at this time. When he opened the fifth seal, verse 9, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. The first four seals have to do with what's happening on earth. Now we are transported back to heaven and John saw the souls of the martyrs under the altar. The altar in the Old Testament was that place where the sacrifice was made to God. 
these faithful martyrs chose to sacrifice their lives rather than deny Christ. Under the altar seems to be a place of privilege and safety in God's keeping. Our society is full of celebrities, is it not? But the true heroes in our world are these martyrs, this army of people who remain faithful to the end with enormous pressure, persecution, torture, trouble, whatever it may be, and they die proclaiming God's life-saving gospel message. They die because they cling to Christ. But see how he has a special place for them. Their deaths were not arbitrary, random occurrences. Even their deaths were appointed by God. And as they lay down their life, they follow in the way of Jesus, their king, who laid down his life. Now, Christians have been persecuted and killed for their faithfulness to the Lord from the very beginning. Acts is the book in the Bible that tells of the beginning of the church. And by chapter 4 in that book, Peter and John are brought to trial. Then they're brought to trial again and flogged. By chapter 7, Stephen, the first martyr, is killed for his faith as he was stoned. Not long after that, Christians faced gladiators and wild animals in the Roman Colosseum. And millions have been killed because they remained committed to the Lord over the centuries. And they still are today. Today, over 360 million Christians face severe persecution. Last year, 2022 alone, 5,621 were killed for their faith. That's 15 a day. This is according to the Open Doors organisation um, that came out of Brother Andrew's ministry, if you've heard of him. They do this report every year. Last year, 2,110 churches were attacked and 4,542 people were imprisoned for their faith. I've got to say, these are conservative figures too. Depending where you look, <laughs> that can be much higher, but they work hard at verifying. In fact, I don't think they put things unless they have verified it. And for these people, these martyrs there under the altar, they're calling out for justice, for the Lord to avenge their blood, but also this sense of vindication that their faithfulness to the end is proved right and good and that that should be proclaimed and seen by all. And when the sixth seal is open, there's a great earthquake. You see, the sun will turn black, the moon will turn red, stars will fall to the earth. The terror will be so great that all people, rich and poor, we see in verse 16, will hide from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. During these terrifying events, people will hide from the Lord rather than repent. And that theme comes up again in chapter 16. Humans have hidden from God, from his presence, since the third chapter in the Bible, as Tions was sharing earlier, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. When the period of God's wrath begins, the guilty will not be able to hide from the judgments of God. All people there in the world, great and small, rich and poor, we see there, will lose their peace, their security. 
The foundations of their lives will be shaken. Food's going to be scarce. Money is worthless. Possessions become irrelevant. And at this time, who is going to be able to stand? The question there we see, verse 16, only those who have accepted God's offer of grace and forgiveness. And these are the ones we now see in chapter 7. After the judgments of these first six seals, there, there's a pause, there's an interlude here that allows for the sealing of this 144,000 of God's servants and a vision then follows of a great multitude of the redeemed. Now, opinions differ widely on the identity of these two groups. But most believe that the 144,000 to be ethnic Jews that have come to faith, that remnant that comes back as we see in uh, Romans chapters 9 through 11, the remnant of Jews that comes back at the end time. Others understand these two different groups to be speaking about the entirety of God's people. 144,000 is a number that represents fullness. And so they're saying both groups are the same, one's viewed from earth and one's viewed from heaven. Uh, several ideas there. But I suppose I'll go with the, uh, that they're uh, Jews that have come to the Lord. The Apostle Paul develops the theme here of, of, of sorry, he doesn't do it here, he does it in uh, 2 Corinthians 1 and Ephesians 1 and chapter 4, this idea of spiritual sealing, of, of having this seal, this guarantee of the Holy Spirit that each believer receives. That seal is a sign of ownership. And here it refers a little bit differently, to God's promise of special protection on his servants. Before he pours out his last judgments on the world, he will specially mark his people as belonging to him. Now, this is going to be distinct from the other marking of the beast that we'll see uh, in coming chapters. Then we see in verse 9, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. In fact, it's one of the great uh, passages in the Bible that none of these things will happen until it says the gospel is proclaimed throughout all the earth to each nation or ethn or ethnic group. Um, so it's going to be a wonderful place in heaven, multicultural heaven. In verse 14, one of the elders before the throne identifies who this multitude are. He says that these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. If that 144,000 are Christians of Jewish heritage, this multitude appear to be Gentiles, that is, anyone who's a non-Jew, so we're Gentiles, who have been saved through faith in Christ during those terrible days of the tribulation. They have resisted the mark of the beast, they've suffered hunger, they've suffered thirst, and they've lacked shelter, exposed to the elements, as we see in verse 16 there. But we also see that they're praising the Lord now with the angels, and they will serve the Lord, and that he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Beautiful picture. Let's just summarize these main points quickly. The judgments of God against the world are determined by his schedule. The gospel is available to all. Christianity is, is not a, a racial-based 
faith like some are. It's for all, and it's gone out into all the world like no other. And a great multitude of these redeemed persons are going to be there. Every nation, tribe, tongue, they're going to be in heaven with us. But we also see that only those who have accepted God's gracious offer of forgiveness and given their lives to him will have that place in heaven. So the offer is there, but people need to take hold of that for themselves. We see that God is faithful, that he will save and comfort those he calls in eternity. We are in Christ, and in that place we are secure when he judges or as he judges. Many Christians you may know have been worried, and, and it's pretty natural again to be worried about how the tribulation might affect them if they think they're going to be around when it's happening. One commentator writes about his father-in-law, Bob. In the 70s, probably because he read Hal Lindsay's late great planet Earth, <laughs> he became convinced that he needed to stockpile food for the family. Yes, he was a prepper. I don't know if he built a bunker, but uh, he was a prepper. He didn't want the family, he said, to starve to death in case uh, of this severe famine that he's reading about in Revelation and in case Christians you know, didn't have the mark of the beast were forbidden to purchase anything during those dreadful days. And so he invested a lot of his savings into hundreds and hundreds of cans of food. He gathered enough, he says here, to feed us sparingly for three years, the whole family. That's a lot of food, isn't it? All the goods had a guaranteed shelf life of at least 10 years. Well, Bob died in 1982, leaving in his garage row upon row upon row of cans that had been untouched. Finally, in 1997, 15 years after he died, the family decided to call in the skip bin and toss it all out. It was a total loss and a lot of money. See, what Bob and so many other people needed to understand is that in one way or another, the tribulation is the normal lot of people, of God's people, over the centuries. If you ask those Christians at the Colosseum 2,000 years ago, it was pretty grim. If you've asked those that suffered throughout the centuries that are suffering today in Nigeria, over 4,400 have died this year in Nigeria alone. They're feeling they're in the tribulation. We prepare for it spiritually, not physically, not by buying tins of food. How do we prepare? Well, first we need to come to the Lord in repentance and trust that Jesus' finished work on the cross is sufficient, bearing our sin and shame upon himself. He takes our place and lets us go free. That is the first thing. Come to the Lord. Accept that gift. Our only certainty, our only security is in the power that he's already demonstrated over death when he raised himself up. And he can raise us up too to be with himself. The other thing to remember is that terrible things have happened in the past. Terrible things are happening right now and terrible things 
will continue. In fact, they're probably going to get worse, according to Revelation, until Christ returns. Don't expect a political saviour <laughs> of, any, of any brand whatsoever. I have conversations with my sister who doesn't know the Lord quite a lot about the state of the world. And I say to her every time, I say, well, it just goes to show man is not capable of solving their own problems, can they? Well, humanity, I should say, should not. We can't. Tell me what's getting better. <laughs> Apart from medical science, great improvements, but generally, so many, you know, politically, things are pretty dire, aren't they? There's no saviour out there but Christ. Things are probably going to get worse. Uh, in fact, I probably subscribe to Ronald Reagan's theory, actually, that what are the, the nine most, was it the, the scariest, nine scariest words in the English language put together? You say, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> Six, whatever it was. <laughs> it's not going to work. But despite that sort of, you know, grim prognosis about man's inability to save himself, it doesn't mean we stop. We must keep loving we must keep doing what we can to be part of the solution. We must continue caring. But most of all, we must continue, well, along with those things, pointing people to Jesus. Because it is the only hope there is, the only hope for the world. So I think we... Perhaps there's, there's this idea, I suppose I get reading this, of, a, of maintaining a quiet confidence in Christ, in the sufficient work that he has done in saving us in a troubled world. And the only way to, I think, maintain that without getting disillusioned, without getting distracted and drawn away, without... Um, I suppose, thinking, you know, what, why we've got to allow all this stuff. Remember that he's getting it to that point where it is going to be better. Yeah, from Genesis, yeah, he made it. What, what does he say after each day of creation? It was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. He made people. He said, oh, it was very good. And by chapter three, we've said we can do it better. And we've fallen. And we're still fallen. And it's been pretty rough for thousands of years. He's the only one that can bring it back to restore it. As we read in that last chapter of Jehovah, as we read here, he's going to wipe every eye their tears. Without God, there is no hope. It might be confusing and difficult, but he is the only hope. The world's not offering any that I see. And so to maintain that quiet confidence, we've got to remain in him. We're going through John in more quiet times over the break. You know, there have been days looking at John 14 and 15. Be in the vine. Connect, abide, remain Tap into that vine. Draw from him and his word each day. Continue to point to him as we have this quiet confidence at this difficult time. Um, did that, that video working, Tony? That's good. We might just have, have, a, have a look at this. What would you dare to do for Jesus? Would you defy dictators? Worship in secret? Sacrifice your safety? Over 360 million Christians around the world face persecution and discrimination every day. 
And these are the top 10 countries where Christians risk everything for Christ. Number 10, Sudan. Unrest in Sudan has increased following a military coup. Violence and pressure against Christians have worsened. At number nine, Afghanistan. Following the Taliban takeover, those Christians who have not fled the country have been forced deep underground. If discovered, they face death. Iran is at number eight. Iranian house churches are seen as a threat by the Islamist regime. Church members who are caught are given long prison sentences. Number seven, Pakistan. Pakistan's infamous blasphemy laws are often used to target believers. Christian women and girls are vulnerable to kidnap and forced marriage. Nigeria is at number six. More Christians are killed in Nigeria than in all the other countries of the world combined. And the violence is getting worse. Number five, Libya. In this lawless land, both native and migrant Christians are targeted, kidnapped, and even killed. At number four is Eritrea. Christians who dare to meet without official permission risk arrest. Over a thousand believers are in jail without charge. Yemen is number three on the list. The humanitarian crisis continues. Anyone suspected of being a Christian will be deliberately overlooked for aid and might be expelled or killed by their own tribe. Number two is Somalia. Islamic militants are intensifying their hunt for Christians and violent attacks are increasing. And at number one, North Korea, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Spies are everywhere. Discovery means death, either by execution or by being worked to death in a labour camp. Despite the danger, in all these countries, the church is not defeated. It is living, powerful, defiant. And for over 65 years, Open Doors has stood with this church. Where Christians risk persecution, our underground networks support millions of believers with emergency food and aid, spiritual care, smuggled Bibles and Christian books, training and legal advice. And where Christians enjoy freedom, we work with local churches to raise prayer and support and to speak truth to those in power. Every day around the world, Christians risk everything to follow Christ. Will you dare to stand with them? We can look